An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 9, June 24th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, if you reflect upon our interpretation of the dialectic as an attempt to do justice in thought itself to the non-identical, that is, precisely to those moments which are not exhausted in our thought, then it is clear that this very proposition involves a contradiction. For the identity of the non-identical expressed as simply as I have just expressed it here would be a false proposition. We are thus presented with a task. The dialectic could be interpreted in terms of this proposition as the effort to confront this paradox implicit in the predicament of thought itself. And it is evident that this difficulty cannot adequately be confronted in a simple proposition. And this is precisely what drives the dialectic to assume the systematic and ramified character that it displays as a whole. In other words, the paradox of the attempt which I have just described to you demands to be fully unfolded as such. And in a certain sense, you could regard the dialectic as a single and very far reaching attempt through the unfolding of this contradiction to confront a task which is given with the very claim to knowledge itself. Perhaps you can best understand the necessity of this thought if you clearly realize that the paradoxical approach which I have just been talking about is not some artificially confected paradox, but one that holds within itself the task of knowledge or cognition as such. For it is evident that thought or the process of knowing only really represents genuine knowing where it involves more than the mere consciousness of itself that is, where it concerns itself with something other than itself, where it does not contend itself with mere tautology. If we want to know something, then, if you will forgive the clever schoolmasterly tone here, we want to know something and not just stay with the act of knowing. In other words, we want to advance beyond the domain of our thought. Yet, on the other hand, precisely in wanting to know this something, the latter itself also becomes a moment of our thinking becomes itself knowledge, and also becomes itself mind or spirit. To know or to cognize something always resembles a process where something other or non-identical which confronts us is taken up into our own consciousness, is appropriated in a certain sense, or made into something of our own. And this paradox that knowing means translating something into identity, while yet relating to something which is non-identical, since otherwise there would be no process of knowing at all. This otherwise irresolvable paradox is precisely what calls for the labor of the concept for that process of both self-unfolding truth and self-unfolding thought, which we understand by the name of dialectic. I believe we have now come far enough for you to be able to grasp the significance of this theoretical explication and interpretation of the dialectic. And from here we can proceed, not without a certain abruptness perhaps, but still illuminatingly, I think, to a more specific discussion of the two fundamental types of dialectical thought which have been presented hitherto. I certainly do not wish to claim that these two types actually exhaust the entire field here. And I am well aware, for example, that there are certain powerful tendencies of an ontological kind today, and particularly in recent Catholic thought, which also strive to develop a dialectical philosophy. I do not wish to go into this question here, especially since I have already presented you with some general claims about the relationship between dialectical and ontological philosophy, and which I can develop in more detail today and in the next session through some much more specific observations about the position of the dialectic in relation to the concept of being. Thus, I believe that I can justify my approach here in taking the two essential types of dialectic to be firstly, the idealist dialectic, as this was developed and defended above all by Hegel, although the thought of Fichte and Schelling, and particularly that of Fichte, already exhibit strongly dialectical features. And secondly, the materialist dialectic, which in terms of its origin is essentially connected with the name of Marx, 
Now, if you clearly bear in mind the interpretation of the dialectic in general, which I have presented to you here, you should already almost be able to derive both of these two principal types of dialectic directly from it, a temptation which I find it rather difficult to resist, and which I fear I shall not indeed be able to resist. For on the one side you find a form of thought, one type of dialectic, where of the two, mom of the two moments which essentially define the dialectic, the moment of identity is the predominant one, where every particular moment of identity is indeed challenged, where therefore, in other words, thought expressly brings out the moment of non-identity within identity in all of its own particular moments, but where a certain reconciliation is nonetheless affected as a whole. It is clear without more ado that this type of dialectic can only be the idealist dialectic, for the primacy of thought over being is indeed affirmed here. It is thus a kind of thought in which, in spite of all the non-identity in the particular moments, non-identity is ultimately turned into something identical within the whole. And since the dialectic always begins with reflection upon the knowing faculty itself, namely mind or spirit, we find that spirit as the principle with which everything is ultimate, ultimately posited as identical becomes in this form of thought the dominant principle after all. If I may put this in a crude and rudimentary way here, the Hegelian dialectic as a whole, and regarded from a rather considerable distance, is indeed emphatically a philosophy of spirit, or more than this, a metaphysics of spirit. In this dialectic, spirit is the absolute. Everything that is ultimately, everything it, everything that is ultimately reveals itself, after all, as a specific determination of spirit. In my own book on Hegel, I particularly emphasized a different moment of his thought, namely what we may call the critical or negative moment. But I should tell you that this was already a specific accentuation on my part, insofar as the thoughts which I developed in my book are actually thoughts which you cannot simply take, take without more ado as an exposition of Hegel's philosophy, as things are intended at any given moment or at any given point by Hegel himself. Rather, this was an attempt to save Hegel, indeed to vindicate him, you may say, in some contradiction to certain central motivations of his own thought. For it is clear that in a philosophical project such as Hegel's, in which the non-identical should be fully acknowledged, yet also ultimately be entirely resolved or subleted in the principle of identity, which is absolute spirit, that in such a form of thought the dimension of the non-identical namely everything in our experience which is not actually spirit, is not taken with complete seriousness after all. And I have attempted to emphasize just those moments in Hegel which, in contrast, do tend to bring out the seriousness of the non-identical, the seriousness of contradiction in his philosophy. But a remark which Max Scheler once made about Martin Buber about hearing one of his religious lectures also applies to Hegel. Serious, very serious, and yet not completely serious. By this I do not mean to say that Hegel's philosophy is not to be taken completely seriously. I believe that I, that I am hardly likely to court this misunderstanding. What I mean is that the thought of non-identity, which Hegel himself so impressively acknowledged, is not ultimately acknowledged with complete seriousness after all, so that the affirmative, consolatory, and, if you like, apologetic moment ultimately prevails in his philosophy, and this is intimately connected with that aspect of his thought which was subjected to such penetrating criticism, albeit quite independently by Kierkegaard and Marx alike. Now for the materialist dialectic. In contrast, if you consider the points we have already made, especially the point that the dialectic is not merely, is not a merely intellectual process, but a process of reality itself, the dialectical tendency to make the moment of non-identity, of contradiction, into the decisive factor does not imply that we must assert some final or conclusive identity of thought and being in the world as it is, that is, in the object of knowledge. You can also express this by saying that, in the Marxian dialectic, the experience which effectively shapes it and stands at the center of attention, taking the expression experience in the sense I attempted it to develop at the end of the last session, session is this the world with which 
The world with which are concerned, the world with which humanity in general has been concerned to this very day, is an internally contradictory world, and that identity which the speculative concept in Hegel already claims in a sense to have at its disposal, and which is sought in the totality of the system, is something which would first have to be established, and the establishment of a form of reality free of contradiction is essentially a matter for human praxis rather than a matter for philosophy. I believe that you can clearly see from these two characteristics of the dialectic how both these types of thoughts spring from the essence of dialectic itself. We can also derive them, of course, from the positions of the thinkers whom they reflected upon in turn, namely from the most advanced position that bourgeois culture has ever come to occupy. From the standpoint of a general interpretation of the dialectic as I have presented it to you, it is also clear that if the idealist dialectic finds itself in extraordinary difficulties in fundamentally emphasizing the non-identical, while nonetheless affirming absolute identity as a whole, the concept of a materialist dialectic is also beset with the greatest and most serious difficulties. Difficulties which belong in the same domain as I have just been presenting to you. If primacy is actually ascribed to the non-identical, namely to that which is not mind or spirit in our knowledge of the world, then in a sense it is also extraordinarily difficult to grasp just how we are to arrive at a dialectic at all. For the dialectical principle itself, the principle of negation or reflection, is necessarily for its part a spiritual or intellectual principle. And as soon as one really tried to pursue in all rigor the thought that everything spiritual or intellectual is mere superstructure, that being, radically deter that being radically determines consciousness, then it would basically be impossible to understand how we ever come to a dialectic. For then we shall have ascribed primacy to something which is precisely a rudis indigestac mol molus, to something which is precisely not intrinsically refracted in and through reflection, but is a mere immediacy. Thus, the concept of a materialist dialectic leads to that difficulty which is bound up with the simplest meaning of the concept of dialectic, namely the difficulty that a conception of the world which essentially involves a movement of concepts, a deal, deal a thorough explication of intellectual forms, is now in a sense hypostasized, as if it thus had nothing to do with such a thing. I cannot resolve this difficulty for you right here. But I wanted at least to draw your attention to it, above all because it is at this very point that we see how the materialist dialectic could begin to ossify into the kind of dogma or state religion which, inevit which inevitably emerges when the thought no longer confronts its own imminent difficulties with full seriousness. But I should like at least to suggest to you where the resolution of this contradiction lies. The concept of dialectic, which is in question, is not a purely theoretical concept of dialectic at all, since the moment of praxis itself proves to be a determining factor, even if it does not by any means assume primacy, for the relationship between theory and practice in the materialist dialectic is an extraordinarily complex and involved one. But the idea of practice or the sorry, but the idea of praxis is acknowledged with full seriousness here. And without taking the concept of praxis, namely the active transformation of the world, into consideration, we cannot actually make sense of the thought that material relations, or what merely exists, could be dialectical in themselves. And, although this thought is not conceived by Marx as a purely contemplative or explanatory theoretical one, there is nonetheless a theory here. The question involves an extremely difficult structure. And towards the end of these lectures, I hope to be able to explore this for you in fuller detail. But I would like to draw your attention here to one thing at least. If we simply apply the concept of a philosophy, of some internally coherent mode of explaining the world, or even, as they do in the East, the concept of some type of science to the materialist version of dialectic, then we already run into the most tremendous difficulties and find ourselves specifically driven by these difficulties to perform the very opposite of all dialectical thinking, namely to turn an intrinsically dynamic form of thought 
which remains critical towards itself into something like a world view to the venerated. I believe that I can now present you once again with the real difficulties which dialectical thought poses for us, and at the same time try to elucidate certain distinctive features which may prove helpful if you attempt to think dialectically yourselves. For the task of any lectures which are intended to introduce you to the dialectic, apart from helping to, to facilitate the study of the most important dialectical texts themselves, must above all be that of bringing you to the very point where the difficulties actually lie, rather than concealing these difficulties with some kind of smooth conceptual derivation. The task is not to render such thinking innocuous, but to convince you of what ultimately motivates this thought precisely where it offers you the greatest difficulties. I hope that the distinctive features which I present here may help you a little in learning to practice dialectical thinking itself. The first of these difficulties lies in the way that part and whole must always be related to one another in dialectical thought. This is a claim that will strike a familiar chord with those of you who are studying psychology for the theory of Gestalt psychology, which is the most widely established academic form of modern psychological thought today, also says much the same thing. But the focus in that case is essentially on the domain of sense perception, and the priority of the whole over the part is tacitly assumed in this connection, along with the idea that the relation between the whole and its part is generally harmonious in character, or at least is not in a relation of tension. I should also I should also qualify what I just said in the sense that Gestalt theory does also or does also recognize the moment of the non-identity of whole in part in its concept of a bad Gestalt. But the entire pathos of this scientific doctrine of the priority of the whole over the part is in, is incomparably less antagonistic in character than it is in the dialectic. I should like to say right away that the idea of the dominance of the whole over the parts was actually first expressed in the context of the dialectic by Hegel and the claim we have already discussed in some detail, namely that the whole is the true. And then again by Marx in the material reversal or interpretation of this claim, when he argued that the totality of this society furnishes the key to all of the individual social processes and that independence cannot really be ascribed to these individual social processes over against that totality. But the dialectical conception of the relation between the whole and parts is actually far more difficult than the very familiar claim that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. For while, on the one hand, it is constantly demanded that the parts must be grasped from the perspective of the whole, and that the whole in turn must be grasped through the interplay of the parts, the dialectical, con uh, the dialectical conception also insists upon a relation of tension between these moments, between the whole and the parts, between the universal and the particular. That is why the effort to bring these two moments together actually proves to be extraordinarily problematic and extraordinarily difficult. The difficulty I am talking about here, and which I wish to bring home to you, is that while the whole and the parts can certainly only be grasped in their relation to one another, we must recognize that the whole is by no means positively given when you have the part. And conversely, that the relevant parts are by no means positively given when you think the whole. Thus, you must constantly ask yourselves how you are actually to bring both these things together. For, as I believe I have already made sufficiently clear, the relation of whole and part in the dialectic is not one of mere subsumption. This is not a relation of logical extension, where the parts would be contained within the whole in the way the segments of a circle lie within its circumference. Rather, it is a dynamic relation, one where both moments reciprocally produce one another, rather than just being given alongside one another in a reified and, so to speak, timeless manner. And we may say in general that the dialectic in its entirety, to employ a Kantian distinction here, has extended the domain of the so-called dynamic principles to such a, such a degree that what Kant presents under the title of mathematical principles, namely the logical principles, also comes to assume a dynamic character. Thus, we are talking about the problem, 
and this is one of the major difficulties with which the dialectic confronts you. Um, of how I am already supposed to grasp the part by reference to a whole, which is never completely given as such. In order to show you how these things unfold with regard to the actual work of cognition, I could perhaps say something here about a controversy in which I was engaged over 20 years ago now with Walter Benjamin when he was writing his work on Baudelaire. I am referring to the unpublished opening part of, it, of this work, and specifically to the interpretation of one of the poems from Baudelaire's cycle, Le Vin, Le Vin des Chiffonniers. At the time when Baudelaire was writing, the rag pickers were seen as extreme representatives of the lumpen proletariat, and thus possessed key significance for the depiction of penury, which plays such an important role in French literature as a whole in this period. You have only to think of Les, Mis Les Miserables in this connection. In his interpretation of this poem, Benjamin had discussed a wine tax which was levied in Paris at the time and which forced the workers to go out beyond the town gates outside the banlieue if they wanted to consume wine, if they could indeed afford wine in the first place. And there were some contemporary French writers who claimed, although this does not sound particularly credible, that these subsequently intoxicated workers defiantly displayed their drunkenness when they came back into the city precisely to demonstrate, in the spirit of an oppositional act, that they had managed to do something otherwise beyond their means, namely to get through, to get thoroughly drunk. And Benjamin believed that he could specifically discover certain motifs of this kind in the cycle Le Vain. I would like to leave aside the question whether that is actually true or not. In looking through this material again recently, in connection with these lectures, the details of Benjamin's argument struck me as rather more plausible now than at the time when we were involved in the original controversy. Anyway, the drift of this argument was to take the question of the materialist determination of reality as a whole, which according to his theory possesses a key role in Baudelaire's poetry as well, and trace it back immediately to specific events and experiences such as the wine business concerned, cheap drinking establishments, the rag merchants, and so forth. Now, I did not wish, of course, to demote the significance of such individual experiences in this connection, but if you consider the idea of a materialist dialectic here, that is, of a theoretical explanation of social facts on the basis of specific material conditions, then it is obviously not enough for a theory of this kind to appeal to such unmediated data about the wine business or the suburbs, however concrete that may appear however tempting such concreteness may be, and however exciting and stimulating the thought of connecting such apparently vivid and concrete data immediately with the highest speculative categories. But this is the same tendency, the same temptation of dialectical thought, which Hegel perceived in the work of Schelling, and the task of protecting thought from this was certainly not the least of those which Hegel undertook to fulfill in his polemic with Schelling. In this regard, Benjamin was more of a Schellingian than a Hegelian. I attempted at the time to suggest to him that it was not enough, where the dialectical interpretation of poetic content is concerned, to identify individual motives or motifs of material contradictions and material tensions of the kind we are talking about here. Rather, the materialist dialectic must constantly and under all circumstances acknowledge that the individual findings on which it is based are determined by the whole, that they are mediated by the totality of society. Thus it is that the individual experiences, however startling and however tangible they may be, never suffice in themselves if we wish to draw social conclusions of a theoretical kind, conclusions which concern the theory of society itself. For the individual moments as experienced must for their part be related to the structure of the social totality if we do not wish to resign ourselves to the mere description of particularly vivid data. And where we are interested in the relationship between Baudelaire's lyric poetry and the age of high capitalism, and this is indeed the first and still unparalleled case of a poetry which is wrested from the specific conditions of high capitalism, we cannot merely content ourselves 
with seizing on individual features of capitalist reality, as these appeared before the eyes of Baudelaire, and adducing them in order to explain the content of his work. Rather, we must try in this connection to derive the commodity character, which does indeed play a quite central role in Baudelaire, from the structure of society as a whole and then attempt to perceive the subjective reflection of the commodity form in this poetry itself, rather than contenting ourselves with individual motivations here. I should remark in passing that the distinction which I am sure you will all have heard of, but is seldom analyzed carefully and is generally also forgotten, namely the distinction between dialectical materialism and vulgar materialism, can be described quite precisely in this connection, and you can then perhaps understand what it really means to repudiate vulgar materialism. Thus, it does not mean, for example, that vulgar materialism should be contrasted with some finer form of materialism. What it means is that, in attempting to explain certain processes or cultural and intellectual forms, or whatever, by reference to material conditions, we should not content ourselves with immediately introducing supposedly material motivations as the real principles of explanation. In other words, a vulgar conception of economics, which imagined that it could derive reality from the so-called desire for profit, the love of money, or other affective predispositions on the part of capitalists, or simply from the so-called desire for profit, even if this is completely separated from any psychological motivations, would represent a vulgar materialist interpretation because it fails to refer to the, total to the totality of the society within which the individual desires of employers and workers assume their specific significance in the first place. That is to say, even if we assumed that all individual capitalists were angels, or rather saints, but were compelled under the, under the conditions of capitalism to engage in economic activity, this would mean that, despite the subjective disposition or despite the complete absence of the so-called desire for profit, Nothing essential would change as far as the development of the social process as a whole was concerned. And I believe I may also say that many of the ready dismissals of the materialist versions of the dialectic as it is presented to us today arise from this very point, for we no longer even make the effort to provide an explanation of social phenomena through their mediation of the totality, but rather accuse the opposing view, namely the materialist theory, of real naive naivety in wanting to explain the world by recourse to something like the desire for profit, or as people love to say, to base material motives and considerations. And once one has ascribed this meaningless thesis to the opposing view, then it is a, real, uh, is a really easy matter to point out that there are other noble and elevated motives to be found in addition to these rather base ones. Now, if you really want to engage with the problem of materialist dialectic, I believe the, thir the first thing you must do is to take the thought involved with full seriousness and dispel any notion that the world is simply being explained here on the basis of so-called lower motives, or that the striving for profit is being hypostasized as the fundamental characteristic of human beings as such. Rather, you should take seriously the thought of the social totality of the objective spirit of capitalism as the genuine principle of explanation here. In response to what, to what I have just said, you may say, you are operating here with the concept of totality. You also say you cannot possibly grasp such a fact in its immediacy. So where do you get this totality from? Indeed, Benjamin was probably quite right. The wine tax and other such things exist. There are quite specific individual tendencies on the part of individual groups who find themselves confronted with specific things. And on the other hand, we have your totality of society, something which, it, which as a thinker and researcher, you cannot really grasp at all, which is merely a metaphysical thesis on your part. This objection incidentally effectively lies at the heart of the most important critique, which has ever been directed against dialectical materialism from within the perspective of sociology. I am talking about the critique provided by Max Weber, who did not, in fact, object, and this testifies to Weber's extraordinary perceptiveness. 
that materialism essentially failed to appreciate the significance of any higher goods or motives in society. Rather, his critique basically argued that the dialectic is a form of metaphysics. For in claiming that the particular can only be grasped from a total perspective, while it never tangibly possesses this total perspective itself as an actual given, it is always forced to bestow absolute significance upon certain concepts, to hypostasize these concepts, and thus ends up producing claims which are just as arbitrary as those of the metaphysics which the materialist version of dialectic was meant, meant to challenge. As far as the business of the sciences is concerned, the problem is then usually treated in a very banal manner. For it is said that the scientist or researcher must pursue the investigation, must gather, classify, and organize the relevant facts, and then also draw upon something like intuition as a source from beyond. And if the celebrated spark of insight is granted, if the beautifully and efficiently arranged facts are subjected to this ray of illumination, then something like knowledge comes about. To discover the answer to this question, to see in this connection how the relation of whole and part must be configured, if we proceed from part, from the part, while nonetheless requiring a whole, which is not itself immediately given, this is actually the difficulty and the challenge which the dialectic presents at this point.